So this week we're getting into parenting, the last topic for our uh, series on relationships. Uh, next week, as I mentioned, we'll have a couple missionaries here to share with us, invite you out uh, to support them next Sunday morning as we kick off our missions conference. Uh, but this week we'll look at parenting, the parent-child relationship, uh, a relationship that I'm sure for many here has brought out the best in you and at times maybe uh, the worst in you. Our children get to see the best of us and the worst of us. It is a huge blessing blessing, but it also can be uh, trying at times. Uh, it seems the, the culture is, has been mentioned already this morning a little bit is uh, really not holding parenting up as, as much as it used to, or the idea of uh, family, even as we're uh, seeing fewer children be born than ever before. Uh, 60 out of 1,000 women uh, are choosing to have children now. It's just the rate used to be much higher than that. The Fertility rate is 1.76, uh, which doesn't even replace us. So uh, rate of replacement is 2.1, and uh, so we're not even replacing ourselves anymore. Uh, but I think in our culture, this is another opportunity for the church to step into that and show that uh, children really are a blessing from God, uh, that, that we have a, a, an opportunity and really a privilege of passing down the faith to future generations um, and, and here at Faith Alliance, I'm glad that we don't just speak that, but we live it. Uh, we have about 40 kids who are three and under uh, every Wednesday night. There's probably uh, close to 70 here who are uh, teenagers or younger, and, and just a great opportunity for us and a huge blessing in this church for us to pass down the faith to future generations. Um, as we think about uh, the children, I think it's undoubtable that, that the parents have the most influence on them. Their teachers, their friends, uh, pastors, people in the community may have some influence, but ultimately the parents are going to have uh, the highest level of impact. Um, we're going to shape how, how they behave, the way that they think, uh, but what I want to make the focus today is really our pursuit to pass on the faith, that we get to shape their hearts into hearts that will be uh, receptive to the gospel of Jesus. Uh, and the idea here is that if if we shape their hearts and focus on that, then Jesus is going to take care of the behaviors. So even more important than having a well-behaved child is that their heart is tender and open to receiving the gospel. Um, and I want to use uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 as, a, as kind of the, the foundational text for this. It's a well-known passage of Scripture, something uh, the Israelites sort of recited almost daily in their relationship to God as they sought uh, after Him and then uh, attempted to pass that faith on to their family. So before I read this, let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll read Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Father God, we just come before you now, and uh, we're opening up your word to us, and we see time and again uh, the value that you place on children, um, and, and not only children, but the family unit as a whole. God, we know that uh, it is one of the means by which you have plans to pass on the faith uh, to future generations. So God, I pray that uh, you just be speaking to us in ways that are helpful this morning uh, with clarity into our hearts. And uh, God, if there are any distractions here this morning, I pray you'd help us set those aside uh, so that we can see all that you're calling us to. Um, and we just invite you into this, uh, invite you to lead us through it. Uh, we pray it on Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Uh, so you see here this uh, uh, saying for the Israelite people that they would be seeking after God, that they would first and foremost love God uh, and his teachings, and then they would uh, essentially immerse their family in it. It would be uh, around their wrists and on their foreheads and on their doorposts as they pass that down to their children. Um, and, and we'll see it again, that's what we're going to focus on, is passing down the faith. So I want to look at four principles today that will hopefully equip us to pass down the faith to our children. And I think this applies.
applies to our children no matter how old they are. I know uh, many of you have young children, but also those uh, who have children who are older, maybe out of the house and grown. Uh, it's not too late to pursue them with the love of the gospel. Uh, so there's four principles we can, we can work around. Uh, number one, be committed to living the gospel. You could call this modeling. Be committed to living the gospel. As one book I read this week said, uh, our, our children will hear what we say, but they will do what we do. Uh, and, and ultimately, that proves to be true time and again. We see it uh, time and again that uh, a child grows up and begins to do what their parents did. They, they follow the modeling of their behaviors. Um, and, and we see this principle modeled time and again in Scripture. As we look at the person of Jesus, he's probably the, the best, most pure example of it because he was the gospel. He embodied it completely. He lived it out completely uh, and, and perfectly. And he invited his disciples to imitate the way that he did things. Uh, He didn't want them to just hear what the gospel was. Uh, He wanted them to really live it out, to do it. He was uh, a leader who was empowering people, and he was sending the disciples out to do the same things that he was doing. Uh, So he not only taught them, but he showed them how to do it. Uh, We see Paul, who is one of the men who followed after that. Uh, He does the same thing. He invites people to imitate his faith. Uh, So he wasn't just teaching intellectually. He wasn't just giving information. It wasn't just a passing on of knowledge. He was inviting people to follow him and how he lived out his faith, to do the things that he did. Um, uh, We saw it last week with wives, specifically wives who are married to unbelieving husbands. Uh, They were to to live out the gospel so beautifully before their husband that he may come uh, to desire to have that for himself. And in the text, it specifically says that she doesn't need to speak the gospel, but she can live it without a word spoken, and that will win her husband over to the faith. So you see the importance throughout Scripture of modeling the Christian life, of living it out uh, in, in, in the ways that, that we interact with people. And let me share one story of, of a time I saw uh, behavior behavior modeled by a parent and then reproduced by the children. Uh, It was a while ago, I was walking up to Lowe's, it was in a parking lot, and there was a mother uh, with three of her children, they they were relatively young children, there was uh, a boy and a girl who were arguing with each other, and this boy starts yelling at his sister, and his mom looks over at him, and yelling at him, she says, stop yelling at your sister, And, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, how do you instruct someone to stop yelling when you are yelling at them. Of course, uh, they're just going to continue to to model that that same behavior. Uh, You know, it was almost laughable. And then I had kids, uh, and I realized (laughs) just how difficult it can be. And you get in those moments when, man, it's kind of tough to... To not get frustrated, I'm certain that I'm sp- I've spoken to my children in a tone or a volume that I don't want them uh, to duplicate. Uh, but uh, I don't think that that should stop us from challenging ourselves to to what God's really calling us to. Um, but I just said that really we're not after behavior modification. That's not the end goal for Christian parents. We don't just want kids who are well-behaved and respectful. Uh, we want kids who have a heart that are ready to receive the gospel. So how does this example of a mother yelling at her son and then her son uh, kind of modeling that, how does that connect to the gospel? And this, this could be used in multiple different ways uh, in the way that we interact with our children. Yelling is only one example. It's probably the most popular example that I hear among young people, so that's why I've selected it this morning. Um, But how does the simple behavior of yelling at our children potentially impact them spiritually as to how they would receive the gospel? Uh, So let's think about yelling. Generally speaking, What typically describes a person who's yelling? How would you uh, describe that individual? What sort of adjectives would you use? I jotted a few down. I put angry, angry, uh, impatient, stressed, tired, a position of power, confrontational or argumentative. Uh, I hope those are fair in, in ways that we would describe someone who's yelling. Now, if we hold those adjectives up to the gospel... And we view those in light of what the gospel is. What scriptures might come to our mind as we think about those words? Uh, I think uh, a few that I jotted down, not specifically, but uh, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love. Love is patient and love is kind. Uh, 
If you're tired, we should go to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is rest. Do not grow weary in doing good. Submit to one another. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus humbled himself. Blessed is the peacemaker. We should do everything possible to live at peace with those around us. So you see, our top priority as Christian parents is to model the gospel, uh, which was just described in those uh, verses. If we model bad behavior, the worst thing is not that our children will then replicate that bad behavior, that they will be disrespectful, that they will yell at someone when they shouldn't. The worst thing that happens is that it really begins to shape their heart in a way that they're not as likely to receive the gospel, that at some point uh, someone is going to want to communicate to them or they're going to have a decision as to whether they're going to follow after it or not. Now, does this mean we cannot get angry or that we should not get angry? Uh, By no means. I don't think that's uh, what we're after here. Anger in and of itself is not sinful. You can look at Jesus being angry as, as he lived out his, his earthly life and the ministry that he did. You see him in the temple courts turning tables over because he was furious. I don't imagine that he was just kindly asking people to leave as he was flipping those over. He, he was mad uh, at these individuals. Uh, you can see uh, one text I pulled up was Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, this is Jesus speaking to some hard-hearted Jewish men. And the text says this, it says, Jesus looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And Jesus was angry, yet completely sinless. But what was bringing about the anger that Jesus had there? It wasn't their behavior, it was their calloused hearts, right? Their stubborn hearts led Jesus to be angry. And it's the same with us as parents. Uh, We shouldn't be mad at the behavior, but recognize the heart issue that's underlying it. And that's what we're targeting, is shaping the heart uh, that that is really going to produce the behaviors that we have. Behavior is only a symptom of what is going on in a person's heart, whether they're a small child or a grown adult. And if I immerse my children in an environment of yelling and high tension, uh, there's a decent chance that they will grow up to be someone who's more quick-tempered, or they will not be quick to be a peacemaker uh, with the people around them. Uh, They'll more than likely have a heart that's ready to be argumentative or confrontational, because that's what has been modeled to them, and that includes that they would be argumentative or confrontational, perhaps at some point when I want to share the gospel with them and uh, make a, a proclamation of what I believe and why they believe it. Maybe they've been taught and modeled to them uh, to, to dig your heels in and to have your own position on something. Uh, so what, would, what should be running through our mind more than anything, more than uh, any parenting strategy or technique, while they're helpful, the narrative running through our mind should be show them Jesus. Imitate Jesus. Uh, if Jesus wouldn't be disciplining or yelling in a certain situation, then we should try and withdraw from that as well. If Jesus may raise his voice or be very upset and uh, put his foot down and and have some discipline, then we should go ahead uh, and have that discipline as well. But our top priority is modeling the gospel uh, to our children. And the next three principles really, I think, are sub-points of that, of just living the gospel before uh, our children. Uh, If we peel, peel it back a layer, uh, of living out the gospel. I think this, these are the three subpoints that we could get. So if you had to boil the gospel down to one word, what word would you use to describe it? Uh, one word to describe the gospel. Uh, I went with love. It's the, the top two commandments for a reason. You love God. Uh, you love the people around you. Um, you know, that, that's what sent Jesus to the cross was his love for the Father and love for the world. Uh, John 3.16 says, In his love, God sent his Son uh, to die for us so that we could have everlasting life. And then the next verse says that he didn't send him uh, to condemn the world. He sent them to save the world. And I think there we see uh, that Jesus, or that God sending his Son in love, the ultimate goal was not punishment. It was not condemnation. It was renewal and strong relationship. Uh, and I think the, the same has to be uh, true for us. The second principle being doing everything in love, uh, that we would love our children, uh, really love in, in all things. So uh, how, do we, how do we go about doing this to be a little more practical? How do we do everything in love as we parent? Uh, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6, 
of verse 4. It starts out with them saying uh, that they would love the Lord their God with all their uh, heart, soul, and might. With everything in them, they're going to love God. And I think that's our first point, is that uh, if we're going to love our children well, if we're going to do everything in love, then we have to foster a love for God the Father. Uh, we have to, you know, be... Uh, uh, engaged in our spiritual life, spend time in prayer, spend time in his word, uh, take our children out and stand under the night sky and uh, stand amazed at who God is, uh, show that we actually love the person of Christ and that we want to follow him and, and that it's more than just a routine that we go through, that our heart has been transformed by God. So we love God. Uh, how else can we do it? Love your spouse. Unashamedly love your spouse the best way that you know how. Husbands, love your wives and let your children know that you love your wife. Uh, wives, love your husbands and let your children know that you love your husbands. Speak kindly to each other. Show one another love in front of your children. Uh, think about how Jesus loved his bride, the church, uh, laid his life down for the church. He, he loved God the Father above all all else, which we should too. After that comes the love we ought to have for our bride um, or, or our groom. Um, and, and Jesus put that on display as well, loving uh, his bride, the church, to the point of death, uh, sacrificing everything he had. Um, and scientific research supports this as well. Where there's a, a strong family, there's likely going to be stronger children. Emotionally, uh, spiritually, it's, it encompasses all of it. Uh, they feel more secure. They feel more confident and themselves and who they are, uh, it gives them that safe space to live uh, and to communicate with people. So we love God. Uh, we love our spouse. Third, you, you love your children. Uh, when has God withheld his love from us as his children? Uh, if you're a follower of Christ, you are a child of God. When has God withheld his love from any of us. Uh, we might turn from him. We might uh, live in rebellion against him for a time. Uh, but as soon as we turn back around, his arms are always wide open to receive us back. Uh, and that's setting the example for how we ought to love our kids, ready to receive them and to show them love. Uh, if your children are older and you didn't tell them enough when they were younger, it's never too late uh, to start pursuing a child in love uh, and modeling the gospel, picking up the phone and letting them know you love them. Uh, maybe there's an apology that needs to be made, extending that uh, to them. It's never too late to start. But the foundation of gospel living is love. We ought to always err on the side of love. Uh, if love is the word that most readily comes to mind as you think of the gospel, I imagine grace might be a close second. Uh, and that leads into the second or the third principle. Extend to your children the same grace that you have received from God. Extend to your children the same grace that you have received from God. Uh, there's a book I read uh, recently. It was given to me called the 14, uh, it's called 14 Gospel Principles That Can Radically Change Your Family. It's written by Paul Tripp. One of the, the, the principles that he writes in this book is this. It says, your children need God's law, but you cannot ask the law to do what only grace can accomplish. Your children need God's law, but you cannot ask the law to do what only grace can accomplish. Elsewhere, I read this, that the law exposes sin but grace transforms the heart. The Apostle Paul talks about that in Scripture, that uh, the law will expose sin, it will make it so we can see it, but grace is really what penetrates into our heart and transforms who we are. And remember, as Christian parents, we're not after just good behavior. We don't just want uh, morally uh, upright individuals walking around. We want adults who have a heart for who God is and a heart for the gospel. And I think grace is what gets to shaping the heart. Uh, we can set all the boundaries. We can set all the guidelines. We can have all the, the right rules and the right disciplinary techniques. Uh, but if we don't extend grace, we're not going to get to their heart uh, and invite them into relationship. Um, a story that connects with this was uh, a few years ago, I was able to be a discipler with Athletes in Action. It's a a ministry that brings college athletes in really from around the country uh, and was traveling around with uh, one of my good friends from high school was managing uh, their baseball team and, and was able to be the discipler for that baseball team for a short time. And one of the, the players that I met, he was probably the guy who had the biggest heart 
uh, for Christ, if that were a measurable thing. But he, you know, he had a heart for God. He had a heart for lost people. And in talking to him, he shared this story. He said, you know, before I went to college, I had this big argument with my dad. Uh, we were just going at it. And I got to a point where I said, Dad, I'm just going to pack up my stuff and leave if you don't want me to be here. And he said he fully expected his dad to kind of, you know, reel him back in and say, hey, you don't need to go that far. You know, it's okay. You can stay here. But he didn't. His dad just was going to kind of let him go. So he took his stuff and he left home. Uh, it wasn't too long before he realized he made a mistake and he wanted to be back home. He didn't really have anywhere to go. Uh, so he calls his dad and he says, dad, look, I know I made a mistake. I know uh, you don't have to let me come back. I'm about to graduate, but uh, could I come back home? And as he said, my dad told me, he said, of course you can return. You're my son. And, and he said, from that moment, it really transformed uh, the way that I thought about life. It transformed the direction I was heading with life because this guy really experienced costly grace. Uh, what would have happened if his dad would just held the line and said, no, you're, you're done. You, you've, you've made your mistakes and, and you can find your own way. Uh, we don't know what would have happened, but we do see here this boy uh, who tasted costly grace and he appreciated it, he loved it, and he wanted more of it, and it drew him into relationship with his father. And in this instance, he knew his dad was a man of faith and that his uh, faith was what was leading him to extend that grace. Um, so uh, we see there the, the power of offering grace. Uh, uh, an article by Tim, or not Tim Keller, John Piper, I read this week, uh, he's writing to parents who have children who are wandering from their faith. Uh, these are older, older children who, who aren't living out the Christian faith. Uh, Piper says, don't lessen the likelihood of an opportunity to be with your child by too many rules. If your daughter smells like weed or an ashtray, spray her jacket with Febreze and change the sheets when she leaves, but let her come home. If you find out she's pregnant, then buy her folic acid, take her to her 20-week ultrasound, protect her from Planned Parenthood, and by all means, let her come home. If your son is broke because he spent all the money that you lent to him on loose women and ritzy liquor, then forgive his debt as you've been forgiven. Don't give him any more money, but let him come home. If he hasn't been around for a week and a half because he's been staying at his girlfriend's house or his boyfriend's apartment, plead with him not to go back, but let him come home. Piper also agrees that there are times when we have to draw a line, but those times are rare. There's a reason why the prodigal son in Scripture is one of the favorite accounts for many people. When this boy leaves with all of his inheritance and then the father welcomes him back in a huge display of grace. Uh, if we want our children to be people who grow up, to love that story and to embrace that story, uh, then we can't only speak it, we also have to be willing uh, to live it out. And I think all of us, we know how difficult that can be, extending grace when it's not deserved. Uh, but that's what all of us have received from God the Father, uh, undeserved grace. Living the gospel, doing everything in love, uh, offering them the grace that God has given us, Principle number four, discipline in love. Discipline in love. The favorite verse of many disciplinarians, we've probably all heard it, Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his child, but the one who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Uh, now many people will say this is uh, support as to why we ought to be spanking our children as, as Christian adults. Uh, so far as I can tell from the background of this word rod, as it's used uh, in Proverbs, it was a rod that was used by shepherds uh, to, gar to guide their sheep as they went along the way, to keep them heading in the right direction. Um, if you've ever worked with cows or pigs or sheep, you may have used a rod of some sort, and you probably know uh, the farmers who use their rod to beat an animal. Uh, you probably also see the farmer who used their rod to guide an animal in the right direction. But the principle that this proverb is trying to uphold is not a technique for how we discipline. It's that discipline in and of itself is needed. It's necessary. It's good. Uh, and we'll even see that it's, it's really an expression of love. As the proverb ends, it says, but the one who loves his child uh, will not, or is diligent to discipline. They will not neglect discipline. 
Uh, so spanking or not spanking does not make a parent a good parent or a bad parent. I think there's enough proof of this in society. We've all seen parents who raise their kids without spanking them and parents who raise their kids with spanking them. And they've both produced uh, children who have a heart for Christ and for the gospel. Uh, neither one of those is necessarily right or wrong. I think it's more of a cultural, contextual conversation than anything. Uh, the point is, if you spank, do it in love. If you do not spank, find a way to discipline in love. But whatever you do, do not neglect discipline. Discipline is important. Uh, it's important in our spiritual journey as well. Uh, we see in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, The Lord disciplines the one whom he loves, uh, and he rebukes every son that he has. So even as we follow after Christ, we are disciplined. Uh, but that's done in love. I imagine most of us can tell if we're disciplining in anger or if we're disciplining in love. It comes out differently. It feels differently when we discipline out of our anger versus when we discipline in love. If you think about how God acts throughout Scripture, when He's acting in anger, what's usually the result of that? God discipline in anger leads to things like Israel being cut off. In His anger, a nation may be destroyed. In his anger, a person may be completely rebuked and, as Scripture would say, handed over to their evil desires. Uh, but anger, as God acts in anger, was really an action of destruction. It was breaking relationships. It was saying, okay, we are done here and you need to go another direction. Uh, most often, his uh, discipline is done in love, which is drawing people in. It's more guiding us as we walk along in our faith. It's not cutting us off and saying we're no longer welcome here. Uh, it's, it's prodding us in the right direction. And that's what it's, uh, the gospel is really calling us to as well, that we discipline in love and offer guidance. Or we're trying to build understanding and trust and healthy relationships, not bring any sort of uh, destruction or severing a relationship. Uh, and that's the result of anger. Um, again, we see here, Many different ways uh, that people can parent. Uh, many tactics, strategies, uh, techniques that can be used. And, and I was surprised uh, the few books I skimmed through this week, how many of them said people in the West are obsessed with parenting uh, techniques and strategies. And it may benefit many of us to not obsess about just the right way to parent and to produce uh, the perfectly behaved children, uh, but just to come back to the gospel principles that really can then use multiple different forms of parenting. Uh, it's, the issue of spanking is a good example. Uh, the principle is discipline them. Uh, how that's done may depend on the child and how God has created them. Some children will not respond uh, to spanking the way another child does. It may be uh, better for them not to be spanked, um, it, but, but we have to hold on to the biblical principles and let God uh, really speak to our hearts as to how we parent in day-to-day -day life. Um, one other thought I wanted to include is that uh, we are not responsible for the salvation of our children and I think that's important to understand. We are responsible to shape their hearts, to pass on the faith, to give them an opportunity to believe. But ultimately, nobody in this room is responsible for the salvation of their children. That is a work of God in a person's heart uh, that only he can accomplish. It's going to come down to their decision as to whether or not they believe. Uh, there are Proverbs that, that direct us in the right way um, and, and principles that we can follow, but there's no, if you do X, Y, and Z, your child will believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Uh, it just doesn't exist for us. That's a, a spiritual issue, um, not just a, a parenting issue. Uh, so whether your children are 2, 20, or 50, uh, underlying all of this has to be uh, parenting saturated in prayer. And I, I think that uh, you know, goes along with it. We can't forget it. Daily praying for our children. If they're wandering from the faith, praying for them. If they're broken relationships, pray for those relationships and see uh, how God may lead you uh, 
uh, to, to be involved in those relationships. As I said, it's never too late to start modeling the gospel, uh, to start leading with love in your children's life. Uh, so that's how I want to end today, give you all a, a few minutes to pray and just bring this before the Lord, uh, recognizing many of you have different situations and circumstances. Uh, just commit your children to God, uh, be praying for the children of this church, uh, and then I'll close this in prayer.